All right. Well, welcome to week three, church history. Uh, this is Dr. G. We are in um, review of all the content material from Church History in Plain Language by Bruce Shelley, which is our text, but also the outline for our course. And if you remember, and I welcome you back if you do, uh, and welcome if you don't. But if you remember, first week out, we, we covered uh, really two major sections, um, weeks one and two material because of the Easter break, which brought us through uh, the first 21 chapters of Bruce Shelley's book. Um, in other words, from the first century right on through to the near uh, just pre-reformational period of the 1500s. So I'm going to start us again uh, afresh today where we pick, uh, uh, pick up where we left off, that is, um, beginning with chapter 22, which is still in the section that we're calling um, the Christian Middle Ages. And I've already read this major division number four's description, so I won't um, repeat it to you. But beginning in chapter 22, we're dealing with um, the title of the chapter and its content, which is the decline of the papacy. Sleeping men and the law of necessity is the chapter name. If you remember, we left off um, in chapter 21 where we talked about the rise of the Dominicans and the Franciscans and the entering in of the Inquisitor uh, into a major part or portion of, of church history. And now we're going to pick up, <coughs> excuse me, from that point and pose the question in chapter 22, why did men and nations come to challenge the worldly power of the popes? If you remember, um, at this point in history, there is a major decline and power shift going on in um, the Roman Empire in the West, which has, at this point, uh, separated from Eastern Orthodoxy or the Roman Empire of the East, um, headquartered in Constantinople. And in this period of time, um, the kingdom itself, as expressed in the Roman Catholic Church, is beginning to see a real transition point um, with its power and its dominance in in that particular uh, segment of the world, which is southern and central Europe and northern Europe, but, but Europe itself. So the key points in this chapter in answering why do men and nations um, come to challenge the worldly power of the popes is to recognize that it's partly due to the corruption and sort of the changing um, perception of human beings of the papacy and its role, but also the massive shifts in the culture that are taking place that are changing the very nature of the Roman Empire itself and the European continent. So that's really more of what's, what's driving it. In that first section in chapter 22, Sleep and Change in the Kingdom, there's this kind of brief covering of the period from about the 1300s to the 1500s, which is, again, the decline of the Middle Ages and the reality of the Christ Christian empire uh, sort of folding up um, in its classic Roman-based sense as a result of that. The actual political empire of Rome has at this point been invaded and sacked numerous times. You know, there's this long, slow, extremely painful uh, disintegration of the culture and society. Um, the Northern European uh, tribes or barbarians, as they're called, are moving in and they're seizing more and more control. As we'll see in a minute, there's an interesting exchange that goes on between the power of the empire and the penetration and truth of the gospel and the kingdom of God sort of backwashing into Europe as the European barbarians move into taking over and destroying um, the Roman Empire itself. The next section in the chapter, A New Voice in Christendom, talks about Pope Boniface's battles with, the Philip, of, with Philip of France and this kind of bipolar, for lack of a better way to describe it, papacy, where the French and the Italians um, you know, are struggling with 
with two different popes that they're attempting to put forward in the power structure. In fact, you know, at a certain point in time, there's a third pope that emerges. Uh, here we'll talk about it in a moment, Alexander uh, V. But there's just real chaos in terms of who's actually in charge of the church and how far the church reaches and how it's functioning as a politically uh, active religious entity in this period of time. Um, you'll remember from this chapter, too, that in the next section, the captivity of the Holy Father, there's the rise of Avignon, France, or French papacy, and its de uh, decentralizing influence that I just described. And then the great papal uh, schism, where there's this formalized conflict between the Italian and the French pope, and the center of power being argued and struggled for in France versus uh, classical Rome. Ultimately, a new pope is elected, that's Alexander V, and that becomes like the third pope in this struggle. Um, and what's underlying it is the, the business of councils, which the pope and the Roman Catholic Church have used to great success before, but now councils, the presence of councils are becoming more and more of an issue and um, gaining more and more power and influence over a papacy that is divided, obviously, and fractured. So the ultimate answer is that people grew weary of the increased, uh, increased corruption of the papacy and began to reconceive religion in terms of decentralized power in national churches, which as uh, Europe in the years ahead, and it'll take um, centuries, begins to formulate its own regions that later become what we call nation states, um, it really sets the stage for the Reformation's breaking away from the Catholic institution that has dominated uh, for so long and um, a more independent and localized and denominational expression of the church uh, being born. Chapter 23, Judgment in the Process, of time is all about two key, what you might call pre-reformers, Wycliffe and Huss, and the influence that they have uh, in this time of uh, declining, dividing power in the papacy and the rise of councils and, you know, sort of the, the, the shifting power uh, centers of Roman Catholicism itself. And in the chapter, we'll first talk about the English zealot Wycliffe, uh, who's a dominion of lordship founded on grace. He's a zealot. He's someone that um, rises to a very influential position and um, really uh, kind of calls the church back to a kind of reformed expression of faith that isn't called that at the time but is really um, a precursor to that, and Martin Luther and the other reformers will pick up on Wycliffe's example. But the issues, again, are um, in the section called Reformer to Protestant, Wycliffe denounces the hypocrisy of the papacy and becomes really the first protester against this sharp divide that's happening between a pope who, or popes in this case, who uh, want all the worldly wealth and power and influence for themselves, and the contrast of the character and the witness and the life and the ministry of Christ who wanted none of those things, and the divide that occurs as a result of having that pointed out. Why, Wycliffe um, works from primarily Oxford for most of his life. He's an intellectual. He's well-published. He's well-versed. He's well-read. He's paid attention to as a serious intellectual force. And the section that comes next in the chapter, the passage to Bohemia, Bohemia talks about his being driven from Oxford by the Roman Catholic power structure because of his uh, protesting of the condition of the church as he finds it in the papacy itself. And then how he has to go to Europe also known as Bohemia in this particular area that he went. And he has to work from there because the Roman Catholics won't let him, you know, continue to exercise the kind of um, influence he does from Oxford. 
and how finally he dies but passes on to his followers an even deeper, more passionate and zealous conviction set born of his own than he carried and multiplies it through his followers. And John Huss picks that uh, part of the movement up and becomes sort of the heir apparent and effective for Wycliffe and his reforming efforts until um, the Inquisition is uh, basically leveraged against Huss and he's ultimately martyred for this protestation set that he's carried on from Wycliffe and the leadership that he provides the, the movement. Away with the Heretics sums up the chapter where Huss is martyred for a weird and you know, a challenging event called the Bohemian Rebellion uh, that uh, really foments internal reform and rebellion against the papacy um, and, and fails at doing that, so Huss is killed. But as a result of that, the foundation is laid for a more externalized uh, protest, which again, really sets the stage for the Reformation and Martin Luther picks up and, and runs with it. Um, the answer, how did the early reformers, Wycliffe and Huss, point the way toward shifting allegiance from the Pope to churches local is that they both, Wycliffe and Huss, in that order, begin an early reformational movement that sets a foundation for an external rather than in, internal reform. And in this passage, that's really Amongst all the contributions that Wycliffe and Huss make, it's really the most important one to recognize is that they um, really exhaust, basically, all the options for an internal reform of the papacy, such as it has become in their day, and set the stage for the Protestant movement, which will move externally from the church itself through the excommunicated, ultimately the excommunicated Martin Luther and later through various uh, reformations that occur on the continent of Europe, in Switzerland, for instance, um, and also in England. So we move from that point then into chapter 24, but as we do that, we move into the major division uh, that is called the Age of the Reformation, the, the fifth division in our book. And it's um, really one of the shortest time periods covered in the text, but it's one of the most intensely packed, full of change. So that the spirit of reform broke out with surprising intensity in the 16th century, giving birth to Protestantism and shattering papal leadership of Western Christendom Four major traditions mark early Protestantism, Lutheran, Reformed, Anabaptist, and Anglican. After a generation, the Church of Rome itself, led by the Jesuits, recovered its moral fervor. Bloody struggles between Catholics and Protestants followed, and Europe was ravaged by war before it became obvious that Western Christendom was permanently divided, and a few pioneers pointed it, uh, toward a new way, that is the denominational concept of the church. So in this 100 and, you know, 30 year period or so, what you see is the rise of not just one major reformation, but multiple that give birth to Lutheranism, the Reformed tradition, Anabaptists and Anglicans amongst others, but those would be the first and four primary. And then the, the setting of the stage in Europe and ultimately in the American colonies for denominational expressions that relieve the um, oppressive and bloodshedding response of conforming uh, religious Christians, uh, you know, for instance, in Roman Catholic tradition against those that they would consider to be heretical uh, and dangerous to the faith. So this shift that happens in the Reformation is not just about the birth of Protestantism, which it is certainly centrally about, but it's also about the, the change in dealing with differences within the church, some of them major, most of them more secondary, but how that gets accommodated um, in, in contrast to how it wasn't accommodated in the past, which was it was persecuted. Right. So in chapter 24, we get into the meat of the Reformation, which is um, 
the title of the chapter is A Wild Boar in the Vineyard, Martin Luther and Protestantism. And this is really uh, answering the question, what is Protestantism and an exploration of who Luther was and what he accomplished. The meaning of Protestantism has some major component parts and defining terms and concepts to it, but is essentially a modification of Catholicism as it was seen back then with different solutions to Catholic problems that are classical tensions between the power structure and the people or the power structure and its um, uh, it's uh, propagation of authority and exercise of authority in light of theological dilemmas and questions and so on. So that's really what it means when the book talks about modification of Catholicism. It's really dealing with the same problem sets that the Catholics have always dealt with, but from a very different perspective that will be characterized into an entirely different uh, mode of faith. Luther's attack on papal authority um, explores his accused or accusation of the papacy of depriving believers of their freedom to approach God separate from any mediator but Christ. And that was, you know, the central concern for Luther, although he had a, a whole number of them that he pinned on the, uh, the, the great church door uh, in protest of all the practices that uh, riled and offended him. But at the center of it, it is really having too much mediation happening in the leadership of the church, in the priesthood, between believers and God as he saw it. So Heretics, Outlaw, and Hero really explores Martin Luther's influence and how interestingly uh, his influence distances the poor and the disadvantaged from the gospel, ironically enough, uh, more so than the rich and the famous and the influential. But as a result of that, because um, he's really empowering princes and uh, rulers and, and you know, uh, warlords and all the rest of them to kind of take control of their people via religion, sliced and diced into smaller pieces out of the Roman Catholic structure, he's, um, he's welcomed in and, and, and treated um, like royalty and becomes influential within powerful circles because he in effect is empowering rulers to become more religiously oriented. So that's kind of a strange and ironic turn of events for Protestantism, but it's, it's true about Luther's life and what takes place uh, during the course of it. And you can read it in the chapter, but his lasting influence is the last part of the chapter where his views define Protestantism and give birth to uh, the, the de formal denomination named after Luther, which is, of course, Lutheris uh, Lutheranism. Um, and the answer to the question, what is Protestantism in a basic way, um, is addressed in that answering four great Catholic questions, Luther establishes, first of all, that man is saved by faith alone, that authority lies in the Bible, not in the church, and that the church is the whole community of believers, not just elect special people or leaders uh, within the structure, power structure and politics of the church, and that Christian life is serving God, it's defined this way, in any useful calling, ordained or lay, meaning it's not just the priests who get to enjoy the benefits of membership in God's family, um, everyone does, and the meaning and significance of a Christian life can be found in the common everyday experience of any person providing they place their faith and trust in Christ alone, they rely on the truth of the scripture, and they enter into the community of believers, which is the church, but transcends, obviously, the Catholic establishment. In chapter 25, Radical Discipleship is about the next uh, denomination to rise, which is the Anabaptist movement, who will be the forerunners of all the Baptist movements, really, to one degree or another, that find their way into Europe and the Western United States uh, on up to today. The key question in this chapter is how did the Anabaptists become the forerunners of practically all modern Protestants? So not just the Baptist movements and streams, but pretty much they, they make a footprint, leave a footprint that in, influences all 
Protestant sensibilities in the West. And this chapter examines who they are and what they believe. The basic belief system of the Anabaptists is to reform the reformers by reinst uh, reinstituting apostolic Christianity. The Anabaptists really go back to the bare beginnings of the apostles, the, um, you know, the apostles' witness and the authority of the scripture uh, to testify to that and then extrapolate from there. They are a radical group that live in the Swiss Alps at the time. That's where they're founded. And uh, Zwingli is their leader. And um, there's the rise out of it, uh, the Anabaptist movement of Puritanism itself, which is sort of a subcategory of the Anabaptist tradition. Kingdom build, Building Gone Mad is a section where, again, another strange event, the bizarre Munster Rebellion, gives Anabaptists as a whole a short-term bad name. Uh, and the details for the reason of that, reasons for that are, are in the chapter, so you can read those. But ultimately, regardless of that, the, the Anabaptists become the pioneers of modern Christianity with their focus on discipleship, pacifism, congregational church authority, a separation of church and state, which is a very modern concept at the time and influences pretty much how church is done from that point forward in both Protestant and Catholic realms, but primarily Protestant at the beginning. So the answer to the profound question, how do the Anabaptists become these tremendous forerunners, is that they lived and died to establish the truth, um, proving that those who live most devotely for heaven or eternity are more in an advantageous and powerful and leveraged position to influence the daily events of mankind right here and right now than those who do not, do not have that perspective or don't have that perspective. So ultimately, the Anabaptist movement proves a very powerful spiritual principle, and that is if you've got your eyes on the prize, you can make a much bigger impact in the daily life of human beings than if you don't have that same perspective and live according uh, to that perspective, which was the key for the Anabaptists. They actually put their lives in order and in line with that kind of eternal perspective. Chapter 26 uh, describes another uh, birth of denominational expression. This one founded in a person named John Calvin. Calvinism is what we're talking about, of course, and it's hugely impactful and influential. Also known as the Reformed tradition, and this chapter explores what the unique features of that Reformed Christianity are. Um, the key points here is, is really started uh, in the meaning of Reformed uh, Christianity. It's really the third Reformation tradition after Lutherans and Anabaptists. Calvinism and the Institutes of Christian Religion, which is John Calvin's handbook for his movement, really focus on um, a theological, uh, a crucial theological um, set of convictions about the sovereignty and control of God, um, not to the exclusion of, but in a, in a you know, very intense and focused way in contrast to other theological uh, convictions. He uh, is also in Switzerland. He's um, really the active functional governor of the town of Geneva, ultimately, which becomes the exemplar city for his uh, reformational expressions. In other words, the whole city becomes Calvinistic in their lifestyle choices and in their um, activities and their businesses and, and everything that define them, including being kind of safe haven for uh, Protestants who are persecuted by the Roman Catholics or even some other uh, groups at the time. Again, the sovereignty of God is the theological central point with Calvinists and the particular and absolute omnipotence or all powerfulness of God in the life of man is what you know, is on uh, display there. This whole idea that God ordains people to be saved and others not to be saved, questions of election, um, a number of other 
uh, things related to the outworking of human history and politics and all the rest of it fall under the umbrella of the, the sovereignty question. So it's a big deal and Calvinism, of course, for good and for ill, makes a huge impact across the world and religiously in general, but in particular the Protestant uh, Reformation. John Knox's Scotland is an example of Calvinistic success in facing off with the powers of uh, the, the king or queen and their ability to appoint bishops over the state church. That's a fascinating story at the end of the chapter. And of course, Calvinism in Scotland becomes a huge reformational and revivalistic movement in and of itself. Calvin's life and teachings birth a Christian faith rooted in God's sovereign will and all of its implications. And again, for good or for bad. And, um, you know, we all have concerns about certain aspects and perspectives of the Calvinistic theological paradigm. Um, it is a huge portion of fresh uh, reformational change that comes from Martin Luther's original efforts to separate from the Catholic Church. Chapter 27 is called the, the, the Curse Upon the Crown. It deals with the Church of England and its rise. question in this chapter becomes, why did England, even without any great theological issue, overthrow the long-standing authority of the Church of Rome? And the, the question, you know, is answered really simply in two ways. First of all, um, King Henry VIII had some marriage problems, uh, and there was sort of, you know, a corresponding political set of problems there. So that's what really started the separation under King Henry VIII of the English Catholic Church from the rest of the Catholic Church, which ultimately then becomes the Church of England or the Anglican expression or communion of uh, Protestantism. So that's an interesting, detailed, you know, long involved story that is explored in a, you know, highlighted way in this chapter. England's initial break with Rome over King Henry VIII's marriage problems and his desire for Anne Boleyn. His dual policy of himself as both king and pope and the publication of the English Bible, William Tyndale's Bible, or otherwise called the Great Bible, becomes a huge influential part in the shift and change of the power structure of the English church as it is first found under the umbrella of Catholicism and then later establishes itself as separate entity. And then the swing to Protestantism really involves um, the tale of Catholic Queen Mary's resistance to the rise of the, the sensibilities of the English people toward a more Protestant reformational expression of faith corporately and was driven by the common reading of this great Bible of William Tyndale's by the common people so that the people themselves began to shift toward a more Protestant orientation and that really ultimately drove the change in the English church um, over the course of time and the throwing off of the Church of Rome. So in two waves, civil and theological, England breaks, making Christian faith a private affair under civil authority and sets the stage for modern Protestantism and modern religious practice in general, specifically through Anglicanism, which is another expression of reformational denominational faith. The American equivalent of it is Episcopalianism, or the Episcopal Church, although there are some branches of Anglicanism that identify themselves in America according to the Anglican label. Um, there's a, sort of an umbrella terminology that, that they use a lot called the communion of the Anglican tradition or the Anglican communion to kind of keep all of uh, those Anglican Protestant uh, professions of faith in the same category. But that whole chapter of the Protestant Reformation in England is a separate but interconnected and linked 
set of phenomenon that chapter 27 explores and is important to know. In chapter 28, there is actually uh, <coughs> a Catholic Reformation, or what some call a Counter-Reformation. The truth is, when you really sink into church history, you'll come into the awareness that there were many more reformations per se, Protestant rooted in Europe, preceding from the time of Luther than we're able to delineate here in this class. And there were many counter-reformational movements, one of which happened within the Catholic Church itself, you know, pushing back and protesting uh, the protesters, and that's called the Catholic Reformation. And in this chapter called Another Man at Manresa, we find out that um, the Church of Rome finally, ultimately, over time, responds to the Protestant challenge in a very big way. And uh, this very important and very influential missionary uh, and pietistic group called the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits, arise within the Catholic Church to kind of drag the Catholic Church back to a more morally focused and, um, you know, sort of corruption, rejecting expression of a more simplistic faith. Interestingly, today you may or may not know that Pope Francis is a Jesuit. So his style of leadership and the way he dresses and, you know, the kind of way that he is the Pope, modernized as it is, is reflective of the Jesuit in influence in a big way. And it's very different than your classical Roman Catholic expressions. But the key points in the chapter are that there's really a return to a more spiritual, mystical Catholicism with an emphasis upon uh, devotion and piety and the rise of saints. There's a call for a general council by Pope Paul for a revision and internal reform and a kind of new austerity in all the practices of the papacy and the church government, a pulling away from corruption in response to the accusations of Luther, really, but they don't deal with him in that sense. They don't give Luther credit, but that's really what, what's going on. And then this individual named Ignatius Loyola, a uh, learned guy, incredibly intelligent, committed, devoted, zealous, rises up, establishes the um, Society of Jesus, and they become really the, the foot soldiers across the globe for Catholicism in the 15 and 1600s and beyond. And the shape of modern Catholicism really begins to formulate itself, uh, including the Council of Trent, the holding of that council, which rejects Protestantism and the Protestant way very vehemently in favor of the, you know, more classic down-to-earth Catholic approach. And so ultimately you see the Catholic Reformation giving a dual response. First, a counter-reformational movement that isolates Catholic power in the southern two-thirds of Europe, which is still true today. The southern two-thirds of Europe are more Catholic than Protestant. The northern portions of Europe and the UK are more Protestant than Catholic. So there's this huge, you know, sort of divide of power. And then the reviving of the actual Catholic structure and piety and the leadership, you know, and all the rest of it, kind of bringing them back to a, a, a more pure and focused set of religious expressions and moving them away from worldly wealth and pol politics and all the rest of it, and, and, and injecting in that a huge missionary focus, which is what the Jesuits were all about, including missionaries to, you know, the American colonies, to Asia, to Japan and China and other places in Asia, just a worldwide you know, kind of effort to bring Catholic conversion to bear across the globe. In chapter 29, Opening the Rock, this chapter discusses what I just mentioned, which is really um, America and Asia and the missionary uh, zeal uh, that's uh, found there. Uh, through the Catholic Jesuit Society of Jesus uh, efforts, the foot soldiers of the faith. I didn't fill in some of the details I wanted to on the key points here, but basically the, the big issue here, if you think about Christopher Columbus and the time preceding the you know, exploration of the New World by he and lots of other um, Spanish and French and, and, and English uh, 
pioneers of global ex exploration. The big issue in this chapter is really how the gospel gets spread. Is it adaptation or conquest? In other words, is it like the Jesuits who go into various places in the world and adapt themselves to the culture and try to preach the gospel contextualized for the people that are already there? Or is it more like the Spanish who go into South America, obviously, and then move up the American, uh, South American continent through Mexico and into the United States to basically conquer and force conversion through the mission systems and through other means. You know, they are plundering the new world and taking all of its riches and people captive and all the while, you know, forcing people to either become Christians or, or die, basically. So, you know, the tension between adaptation and conquest uh, doesn't end in the 17th century or, uh, or even in the 1700s, 1800s, that is to say the 18th or 19th centuries, or even today. But, um, you know, it, it really starts this, this difference in approaches for spreading the gospel uh, through the globe really begins to find um, a separate definition, you know, in these two schools of thought. Should we conquer people or should we reach people, you know, in a more loving and contextually a culturally sensitive way. Chapter 30 is the chapter called The Rule of Saints, which is really about the rise of Puritanism, which is not new at this point, but we've already seen that it's it's become uh, known and, and expressed and developed through the Protestant Reformation. The key, the key question here is, what is Protestantism? What was it originally? And so this chapter discusses the public and personal call to live by faith according to the word of God, the um, legitimate and authentic zeal that the Puritans had for living a life in community in the real world that was dedicated to Christ and under the you know auspices of the authority of scripture and so on. They became known as the people of the book, the Geneva Bible out of Switzerland. And a sense of destiny is the literal people of God in the model or template of ancient Israel becomes sort of, you know, some of the hallmarks of the, the movement. Of course, the American colonies largely, not completely, but largely are established by puritanical uh, leadership and puritan uh, colonization. And that has a huge influence, especially in New England, for the tenor and the tone and the atmosphere of the religion and religious expression in the colonies, and and ironically, how much um, other traditions like Congregationalism or Presbyterianism and Anglicanism and so on are allowed to be active in the New World. The Puritans were not terribly tolerant, and so um, they are ironically kind of tried to carry on the oppressive. Uh, responses to differences of opinion rather than embrace and embody the denominational approach. But even they uh, are forced over the course of time to, to recognize that there are lots of other types of Christians that don't fall under their category of belief that they need to figure out how to live with. <coughs> they are persecuted, of course. That's how they end up in Holland. And then, you know... <coughs> Excuse me, if you know and remember your American history, they end up traveling to the New World to uh, begin colonies, religious colonies, particularly in Massachusetts and um, Upper New England. Uh, the rule of the saints uh, phrase or concept um, refers to the quite powerful rise of the Puritans for a period of time in England where they actually were instrumental in, in having the king removed and executed, uh, King Charles, and that's in the book, and you can read it. Um, but that period in England isn't um, long-lasting, and the Puritans, as influential as they are, lose some power in the, in the political and royal realm after that event. But ultimately, Puritanism is huge, like Calvinism 
It provides for Christians of every generation proceeding from that time. A model of the Christian faith is a decisive commitment to Jesus Christ and how the soul expresses itself within the public arena in the context of a Christian nation. Um, when people talk about America being a Christian nation, usually what they're referring to is the Puritan uh, presence and influence in the early colonies and how that permeated, although again, not completely at all, but it permeated um, so much of the American experience early on. Some people argue that the entire experience of America was Puritan based, but that's not completely accurate. Uh, there were lots of other um, diversity points in, in that, but the Puritans were huge and were very prominent in the New England colonies and set a real footprint and, and stamp a signature, you know, kind of on the, on the American soul as it was born and began to grow and ultimately became this revolutionary movement that developed into these here United States. Last chapter in this section, and we're done. Unwilling to die for an old idea is really the discussion about um, denominations and denominationalism. Uh, how did denominations come to be the primary expression of Christianity in modern times? Well, the, the denominational form of church grows as a response to the modernization of European and Western thinking as a result of the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, the rise of humanism, a number of different things happening all at once in that, you know, sort of five or 600 years that proceed from Martin Luther and really shape what we know the Western consciousness, Western civilization's consciousness to look like or to be. And it's this idea at the bottom line of it all that, you know, if you've got Christians who are professing Christ and they don't agree on uh, every little point or every, sometimes every big point of theology subsequent to the crucifixion and the basics, you know, the non-negotiables of the faith, that rather than persecute and and destroy them like heretics, like the Inquisition and all of those who promulgated that movement attempt to do, we ought to just live with them and we ought to live with them with distinct labels and distinguishing marks in place, otherwise known as denominational boundaries, and figure out how to get along and honor Christ at the end of the day, even when we disagree um, about maybe a lot of, you know, or, or most of everything else. And so the various sections and key points are listed there for you, but what's most important to know is that there was a series of wars in Europe ending or culminating with the Thirty Years' War. They were all really terrible wars, all rooted around uh, the differences of people within the Christian faith. A lot of bloodshed, a lot of, uh, you know, oppression and, and cruelty and martyrdom and so on. And at the end of it all, people just got thankfully tired of it. And again, came up with some new notions about how we ought to um, more, uh, freely create space for people to disagree and to figure out and discuss their disagreements and agree to disagree if that's what's necessary in order to function alongside one another in a, in a quote unquote Christian nation. So the idea of denominations is a new theory that's really born of a modern sensibility and the reality of, um, you know, violence uh, perpetrated by Christians through the course of many, many hundreds of years in response to ideas that they didn't agree with, most of those Christian in nature, and this idea that we're all united in Christ at the end of the day, so why kill each other over differences? Let's figure out, again, a different way to handle those. This denominational form of the church has marked recent history, not because it's ideal, but because it's better than bloodshed and bigotry. And so, as we talked about uh, this in discussion group, and we'll talk about it again, we recognize that perhaps denominationalism is not the end of the road for Christians trying to figure out how to get along when they disagree. Maybe it's just another stage in the larger context of church history through which we're moving to a better set of expressions for our differences and disagreements about small and large things, okay?
And so that ends this particular week's set of concerns. Um, I want to thank you for plugging in and paying attention and uh, joining with me. And I hope that you are getting a lot out of this. We'll look forward to meeting with you on Thursday night on Zoom and discussing any questions that you have. Please do email me questions about these chapters in this segment. It's a very interesting period of church history, super important, because it is the root of all our Protestant experience flowing from first Martin Luther's contributions and then all the rest that we've discussed and more so even than we've had time to discuss. But um, you can send me those questions and I'll be prepared to talk with you about them in advance and we'll talk through this particular segment uh, when we see each other. Thank you.